just had a baby, billboards in Times Square, commercials out, all this literally rising star. My greed for money blinded me from all the stuff that was right in front of my face. And it was the first time in my life that I ever was like, what was I thinking? They sentenced me till 2014, back in 2003. I remember when I didn't feel like I could fight to get out anymore, that I, there was just a surrender in me. And I was like, you know what? What can I do in here that I wouldn't normally do out there? Garen Jones. I just, Mike Jones. Mike Jones. <laughs> I, just, I had to say that. I was like, Gary Gar Jones. Welcome to uh, Laguna and welcome to Wake the Fake Up. It's uh, great to have you here in person in the material. We met, you know, a few months ago or last month over at Andre. Shout out to Andre. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've been connected to your spirit. I've known, I've seen you come across because we have mutual friends. I mean, when you run in the circles that we run in and, and the embodiment community of really, you know, bringing forth um, the ancient alchemy of who we are as men yeah. and being able to tap into those things. I don't think it's newfounded. I think it's ancient. Absolutely. Um, you know, we start running across similar brothers and sisters and the energies. And so it was, it was great to, to meet you in person and it's great to have you here. Welcome to Wake the Fake Up. How are you, bro? Man, I'm so fabulous. Straight <laughs> from the plane. <laughs> Last time I drove to Laguna was a two-hour drive. This one was three hours and 47 minutes. You came at the craziest time. I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't prepared for it, but then I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but it was perfect because I turned my car into a university on wheels, and I started had clearing conversations with people that I need to just get some stuff off my heart and cleared those containers and told my wife how much I loved her and just I used that as a, an intentional time of really uh, just gaining and regaining connection with those who like I really appreciate and love. I love that. I mean you're you're not forcing, you're flowing, you're bobbing and weaving and that's really you know an important metaphor or an analogy to life. You know how, how are you going to uh, deal with uh, the painstaking energy of sitting in traffic in Southern California <laughs> right off a plane. It's funny. I actually did a post yesterday on road rage. I said something on the liking of, you know, I could be in Vipassana or sitting in the jungles with shamans and completely in Samadhi, but put me right back in behind the wheel and boom, I'm ready to, to bust, bust somebody's head open. You know what I mean? Bro, I got a, I got a crazy <laughs> story about road rage. So before my, um, my uh, non-emotional intelligent past, sure. I would have the craziest road rage. One time somebody had cut me off and I took an open, I mean, this full Snapple bottle and threw it at their truck and stopped that in front of them. I was like, fucking come on, come on, it's crazy. And now, because I understand the art of energy transmutation, now when somebody cuts me off, I'm like, oh, I really admire the passion in that person. I wish I had somebody like that on my team. <laughs> right. And so I instantly take that energy and infuse it inside of myself. But then also by harnessing that and taking what would normally be anger, anything, and giving it another direction and another home, it allows me to be truly like a witness and present to life and how nature's rhythm starts to always cycle around. And then me being a witness, I just keep seeing these cyclical patterns. I'm like, huh, this used to take me out. Now I'm learning how to make it my favorite dance partner and infuse that energy and then assume that power and transmute it in something that's actually beneficial for myself and humanity. The Philosopher's Stone, there it is. That's the true alchemy. Mm. Instead of taking real lead to gold, you're taking something that would once trigger you, ready for war, ready to fight someone, ready to kill someone, who knows, and uh, turn that into the biggest lesson ever. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's really what it's all about, right? It's, it's about how we are choosing to make a choice and how we react to things. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's interesting because I, I see so many 
people out there that are in their suffering and they're in their escapism behavior, their poverty conscious, it's victimhood, things like that. Um, those are the moments where they're actually unleashing all that energy, that mm-hmm. stored up trauma yep. to some complete random stranger who we have no idea what's going on in their life. We don't know if they lost their mother the day before. We don't know if impending doom is coming. They just got a diagnosis. We have no idea. Yeah. But we take it so personally. It's a really interesting trip. And I think it's a good thing to study from a different vantage point to learn more about ourselves and learn how we cope with things and handle things. So that's awesome that you've had that experience. I, I've fought in people. I remember when I was 21, <laughs> 22, I, I brawled people on the streets. I got into boxing matches and then it's like, all right, time out. We got back into it and then finally shake hands. A lot of handshaking at the end of these uh, boxing sessions, but yeah. just over someone cutting you off. It's really interesting mm. that, yeah. that that realm of thought. Um, let, let's get right into it. You know, I I I know your story now to a certain extent. I don't know ninety nine percent of your so story, much. <laughs> so but, much. but I know one part of it, and we can go directly into that, and then and then like a spiral or like a double let's triple helix. We can kind of move. And expand so anyone listening can can take some points from this because that's okay. the whole point of us conversation. Absolutely, right. And so you had a very interesting experience with the federal government, right? Is that but the, the European government? Oh, this was in Europe when I was in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought this was in domestic U.S. No, this is me overseas serving a twelve-year sentence for smuggling drugs into from one country to another focused on money and money only. Yeah. What happened? Um, so I had a girlfriend, um, I think it was like 2001, and she lived in France. So I followed her to France, just chasing women. And you chased a French girlfriend all the way to France? Oh, absolutely. I she love was, it. She was, I won't say <laughs> what year, but she was Miss France. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Right, good for you. Um, and I was over there, and she was out of town one day, and then I was in a, a nightclub, and I saw a familiar face, someone who I knew of from L.A. I didn't know them, but I knew of them. And when you're in a different country and you just see a familiar face, especially when you're in a country where it's a completely different language than the one that you grew up with, I saw somebody who spoke English and from the same city that I'm from. Complete magnetized to that person. It just course. literally amplifies. Absolutely. So I see them. I see the cars they drive, the bottles they have, the models that are around them. And I always knew I was supposed to have a life that was big like that. I didn't know how I was going to get it. So the only frame of reference was asking, how do I get it? So I literally... In conversation, was talking to these guys and asking. I was like, you know, how can I get a life like yours? How can I do this? And it, one thing led to another, and without saying too much, because a lot, a lot that I can't talk about. Sure. Um, one thing led to another, and I'm in about two days. I was driving a um, luxury vehicle uh, over the border onto the ferry and into Rotterdam, and my only job was to get the car there. They'll pay me 4,000 pounds cash. At that time, it was 2.3 US dollars. I mean, 2.3 US dollars equaled one pound. So you can do the math. I'd never had that fast cash in that way. I'm like, yo, this is not a long drive to get 4,000. Well, I did the route seven times, in, in the amount of two months, so I kept flying into town, doing the same thing, flying into town, doing the same thing. You know, that's like, that greed is like, oh, just one more. Of course. Just one more. Yeah. So the last just one more, they flew me into uh, France and everything about it was felt wrong because I was like UK to Rotterdam, UK to Rotterdam. This time is France to the UK. Everything felt wrong. All the spidey senses, all the yuck, yuck in my gut. You remember that? You oh, I like it's like visceral. it was yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Like stop, stop. The universe getting louder. Tire goes on a flat, and I'm still driving. I was like, money, 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 money. Get to the border, and my scapegoat is because I was a model, 
And every time I would get to the border, they're like, what are you doing in town? I pull out of a, a cover of a magazine. I'm here for a photo shoot. They're like, oh, this is really good. They let me through every time. This time, they didn't let me through. They asked to x-ray my car. They, I mean, they, um, to open up the car. They saw these Congo drums, which I... Knew they were Congo drums. I never knew what was in it. What's I a Congo knew, drum? Uh, the the, oh, the okay. drums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom toms. <laughs> so there were Congo drums in the You're back. Sitting in the back seat. No, no. They're in the trunk. They're in the trunk. Okay. Yeah, they're in the trunk. Uh-oh. I knew that what I was doing was a bad thing. I just didn't know the details of exactly what was in it. So I just knew that I'm Plausible running. Plausible deniability, I, or it was an energetic thing on your part? Because if I knew it, then if I knew it, then I probably would be putting out an energy of, I know I'm doing something wrong, uh, like, I know I got something bad. But if I didn't, if I didn't, and in my mind and the frame of reference I was living at was, if I don't know... And if I say I don't know, then I won't be lying. Okay, I got you. Out of sight, out of mind. Yes, yeah, out of sight, out of mind. Activating that. Okay. They put those drums through the. Uh, this, so this is going into back into the UK or going back. This is going France? from France, trying to get into the UK at the border. Got it. So is that on a ferry? No, no, no. What do you? So the ferry is going from the UK um, through this long drive to a, I mean to a ferry into Rotterdam. Got it. This one is drive to drive. Got it. Yeah, no ferry. Okay. okay. So I get I get to the border. Everything about it feels wrong. Congo. What year, what year are we talking about? 2001. 2001? 2002. I was in there from 2002 to 2005. So this was 2001? 2002. It happened, okay, so it happened yeah. right after 9-11. Yep. Okay, mm-hmm. all right. They x-ray the drums, and as soon as the x-ray... Past, you saw these like little squares, and I. I Are you watching this happen? I'm watching it. Get the fuck out of here! And here's the crazy thing. Fuck. I'm on billboards in Times Square. I got national commercials out. I got music videos out. Like I was like Beyonce jumping, jumping video as her love interest. So I got. I was in all these magazines. The thing about is. And at that time, it would take like six months to, for money to come in. So I had all the notoriety of people seeing me and uh, on L'Oreal hair and all this, but the money wasn't coming in. Who was in your camp? Who was? I never had anybody in my camp. You were completely solo in this whole thing? 100% night. solo. Wow. This was the dark side. Yeah, yeah. There's the, what I showed people, and then there was who I really was. Sure. Or the, the path I chose. Right. Okay, and so you're seeing this pop up on the x-ray. And as soon as they saw this those the, little... This is the French police? Yeah. I didn't even get through the border. Yeah, yeah. As soon as they saw those little bricks, they put handcuffs on me because they knew it was something. So they pulled out the drums, they opened it up, and it was hollow. And they were confused. So they took an axe and opened up. So lined on the inside of the drum with these little yellow bricks and they one by one it ended up being 6.2 kilos of heroin oh and i am the most anti-drug person you will ever meet never had a sip of alcohol in my life and right now i'm staring at years in prison you're staring at the unknown actually the unknown you have no, you have no idea no idea no what their jurisdiction is what their laws are this is crazy right after 9/11 i mean there's whole uh, implications are through it the was roof. during the time where the entire world hated europe hated george bush yeah of course so i was associated because i was of america the only thing that saved me cuz i was a black man with tattoos and a lot of gangsters that were in prison pattern their life off of the gangster rap and things like that. So they immediately associated me. They're like, oh, they're like, fuck George Bush and things. I was like, yeah, no, I get you. I, I get you. And it, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Yeah. Before, let's it's not, a whole thing. Yeah, that's a whole thing. And and look, like we're going to get into the cool stuff, but this is a really cool story actually because you know, I'm not saying this is a cool story, but this is this is wild. Yeah. You know, this is like one of those documentaries that they have on – you know, getting locked up overseas, you know, some shit like you that. You know, what's funny is 
I literally have a documentary out on Locked Up Abroad <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and VH1 for the same story. That's the, that's the best. Thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fuck it. You know, if you, why not? I mean, yeah, yeah. Let's get your get it. Let's get it out there. Um, you know, some some person who's probably got yeah. the same karma energetically as you might be forced into the same decisions. This isn't a needle in a haystack. This happens all the time. Yeah. Right? People get preyed upon. There's so many different routes here. So, so immediately, what are you, what are you thinking in that situation? <sighs> no. Who's at home? Like, where is your I family? just had a baby. You just had a baby. I thought this came probably a year or two after this. Oof. Just had a baby. With the French woman? No, the woman in, in America. That's never. So, so just had a baby. Billboards in Times Square, commercials out. Yeah. All this literally rising star. Yeah. My greed for money blinded me from all this stuff that was right in front of my face. Yeah. And it was the first time in my life that I ever was like, what was I thinking? Every girl I'd ever slept with, every car I ever broken in, broken into, every house I ever broken into, I never felt any level of remorse. Of course, yeah. In that moment, everything that I thought I got away with, I was like, oh my God. Mm. I thought I escaped karma. Mm. And so instantly I'm like, I'm not even going to prison for what this is. This is a co combination of years of things that I thought I got away with coming back to me and saying, hey, told you I'd come back to you. Right. So I was deathly afraid, I was scared. I, I was like, yo, I can fight. I don't know prison fight. I don't know the unknown. You didn't know their judicial system. No, so, I didn't know anything. So, so what what happened? Did they send someone from the U.S. diplomat to? Dip Not until like after a week. Okay, so they put you in a cell. Yeah. Um, they treated you as like a. This is a villain, right? So, yeah. So they George, put George me in a big deal over there. They put me in a holding cell first. Yeah. So I was in a holding cell for a whole week. They gave me one square of bread per day. I didn't get to brush my teeth, didn't get to shower, sleeping on a cold floor with just my jacket. And every single day they would bring me in and try to get me to snitch on who I was working for. Sure. But unfortunately, the person I was working, who, who, who I was working for is kids went to the same school as my daughter. And so the decision is, I say his name, he knows where my daughter goes to school. Yeah, and these aren't the kind of people that you uh, that you play those kind of games. So yeah, well, if you make a decision to get into to do these types of actions, you you hold that code. So I took it. Yeah, for everything. Yeah, and from there, they put me in a French prison. Now in America, they you get your first phone call right away. Yeah, I got my first phone call after a year. After a year. One year. So someone had to, I mean, you had all these things going on in your life. You're yeah. on billboards, you have all these different things. Someone realized you're not here. Yeah, so consulate came, got a hold of my mom, and because Where I- did you grow up? I, I originally grew up in Houston, Texas, and then moved to LA and lived in LA for 21 years, and now I'm back in, I'm in, in Austin, Texas. Right, so, you were, you were, so technically you were from LA during that moment. Yeah. Okay, okay yeah. so they contact your mom. Yeah, so they, they, they contact my mom. The, the the consulate, let her know what's going on because no one could, you know, you couldn't just write a letter. The people that were local could write a letter and they get there in two days. Yeah. Because I was in there for drugs, they had to screen and decode every single thing. And it would literally take me two months to get one letter home. And then that amount of time, maybe a month for it to come back. Right, so everything's out of the snail space. Uh, yeah. Right so, so, yeah. Wow. Yeah, bro. Oh, man, that's, that's heavy, dude. I've had some, you know, run-ins, and I've had some experience with law enforcement, you know, as a kid. I was wilding out and stuff like that, and I, I know that feeling of being held. It's a, it's a total trip. 
it's a mind trip, especially energetically for s- some people. Yeah. You can't comprehend it. And so at that moment, um, you had to just drop into here, I'm assuming, deep, deep, deep. I was afraid because of the stories that I watch on TV, because the scared straight and all this other stuff. I never knew anything about like how European prisons are. But then when they gave me this little box and it had like this little bitty like butter knife, I don't know what it was about the knife, but as soon as I saw that, something inside says, Garen, it's going to be okay. Just Mm. trust. Mm. And I was just like, where the fuck that come from? Mm. But he's like, what is it about this? I don't know. And so when I went in, it's interesting, I went in in fear. And then all of a sudden, they were like, oh, American, Snoop Dogg, uh, 50 Cent, uh, Wu-Tang Clan. And I was like, and then the most dangerous people in prison actually wanted to be my friend. And they wanted to be my friend because I was the closest thing to the real thing of what they emulate, which right. is hip hop culture, gangster cl- culture. Yeah. I wasn't a gangster, but I was I was in there for drugs, yep. fit the bill, black man, tattoos, lived in New York and, and uh, L- L- LA and New York City. We're East Coast, West Coast, Tupac and Bibby. Bibi. So all they wanted was information. Yeah. So the most dangerous people that killed people to get in, killed people while they're in, they wanted to be my friends. They say, anybody mess with you, just let me. And all they wanted was to be associated with the American. You were in Gen Pop, like you were regular general population, or well, I was in. I was in. Um, how can I put it? It's until I got sentenced because I didn't get sentenced till after a year. Right. That's when they let me into like the, the 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 big part. Yeah. But I was in there for a whole year, and like a holding stage. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can't, especially in French prison. It's a sign of disrespect if you appeal. Interesting. Yeah. And they want you to take it on the chin. It's a completely different justice system. And there's like... From the correctional officers or from the prisoners? No, inside the courtroom. Inside the courtroom, it's it's way different. So if you appeal, you're gambling, you're doubling down. Oh, you're you're gambling with more time. Oh, interesting. It's a sign of disrespect. You know, there's something to that. To a certain degree, mm-hmm. right? Where it's because it's just, it becomes more headache, more head work, mm-hmm. more legalese, more money, all that kind of stuff. Unless you're completely innocent. And yeah. it's like, you, you have to have provocation for what you're doing. Interesting. So you, you, you pleaded like no contest or you just took it on the chin? How does that work? Uh, the, the, I'm asking I this, said, this is interesting for I me. I said not yeah. guilty. You said not guilty. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Here's the thing. Yeah. What was in side of all of this stuff? Because once it all went down, yeah, it was associated with stolen luxury vehicles. The car I had no idea that it was a stolen luxury vehicle. No idea that it was six point two kilos of heroin. The one thing that saved me was the newspaper that was inside of the lining was from a was from a city that I had no rec that they had no record of me actually being in so it goes to show that somebody else wrapped it so when i said i didn't know anything about stolen luxury vehicle i was like this i'm just driving a car yeah your role is to just drive a car 100% okay so the intent yeah yeah that's powerful yeah Wow. Okay. It, there was there there was That's a lot huge. in that, brother. Yeah. Whoa. So I'm in there. They sentenced me till 2014. Back in 2003. So I wasn't supposed. So in that moment, I'm like, my life is over. This is over. This my is 20s over. Twenties are dust. Everything is that. My daughter. All, yeah. Everything. Yeah. It's like a, you felt like you were in a movie that you'd watched. Hundred percent. Like some Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption. Redemption or something. No, this is gonna come up though. Okay. <laughs> so I um, I remember when I didn't feel like I could fight to get out anymore. That I there was just a surrender in me, and I was like, you know what? 
how, what can I do in here that I wouldn't normally do out there? Mm. So it, because I asked that question, it started to trigger something different in a different part of my brain because I never asked that question before. I stopped using my non-dominant, my, my dominant hand, which is my right hand, and literally just started using my non-dominant hand, mm. which I didn't know was operating a different part of my brain. Yeah. And so I got so good at writing with my left hand that my left hand became better than my right hand. And then the better and more acute my left hand became, 10 times more sharper and acute this was. Mm -hmm. And I started noticing and I was like, yo, I'm starting to be more creative. And I started reading all these books and I read The Power of Positive Thinking and I was reading the Bible cover to cover, the Quran cover to cover and mystery books like Agatha Christie. And, and I'm just like reading and reading and reading. And then one day we're allowed to watch uh, movies once a month. Shawshank Redemption comes on. They play Shawshank Redemption in prison. That's the best ever. <laughs> order, order the, the rock chisel. Yeah, so here, <laughs> here's the thing. Anthony Dufresne, Tim Robbins, yeah. in a line he says, they can take anything they want away from me, but they can't take away my mind. Yeah. Oh, soon as I heard that. And I'd seen that he movie that before. Red, right? he said, yeah. He said that to Red? Yeah. So I'd seen the movie before. But being in prison and watching the movie, and I was like, oh my God, I know why I'm in prison. Because every day while I was free, I used to say, I feel like I'm so far away from where I'm supposed to be, like I'm in prison inside of my own body. Yeah, yeah. And I was literally far away from where I was supposed to be in prison. Right. And I said, if I can think myself to prison, well, in that case, I'm a free man. Yeah. What would a free person do? What would a free... And a voice inside says, Garen, everything you used to love to do when you were a kid. What did I used to love to do? Oh, I used to love to run. That made me feel free. I used to love to sing. I used to love to dance and do visual arts and everything. So I started doing it. I was drawing and painting and an inmate. I was painting portraits of their family members. And... Uh, they're like, oh, thank you, in tears. Do you want anything? No, I, I, I was so fulfilled with whatever was welling up inside of me, and it was just easy for me to just share that joy. Mm. And then I love to motivate people, so I would just, I learn French, to speak fluent French, and I was just motivating people, and then it'd be a crowd of people around me just hearing me talk. And it was just something I was giving away. And whenever I would sing, an inmate goes, every time you sing, it makes me feel free. That was in another cell across the hallway. I just kept singing, it, but I was already free in my mind. And I was just sharing, but that's what I used to do when I was a little kid. But my greatest joy, my greatest sense of passion, desire, freedom, like literally time stops where all my downloads come from, is when I'm just running. Not running for time, not running for abs or workout, just... Running is my form of moving meditation that I know now. But back then, a little voice says, Garen, run. You love to run. Nobody was running at that time. I saw stabs, drug deals, um, fights, all this kind of stuff. Then one day, I started running. 30 days, 60-something in inmates was running with me. So it went from nobody to me just doing what I love. Your embodiment. And then all these people started to follow, less fights, less drug deals, less stabbings. And to close this out, when I felt free, key word, felt, not fought for freedom. When I felt free and I embodied the characteristics and all that my inner facilities were freedom frequency, it's like a, the essence of like aliveness. They called me into the office, which I thought I was getting in trouble. And they said, Jones, we retested the drugs. They had no reason to retest the drugs two years after I'd already been in there when they'd already tested them three times, 6.2 kilos of heroin every time. Now I feel free. They call me in, retest the drugs, and they say 90% was fake. And for the amount that was real, 
You've already done the time. You're free to go home. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. You mean that those drugs were cut? They were cut. They nobody were, knows. Nobody knows. Wow. Wow, the biology of belief is real. But I will tell you this. Now knowing, I won't say now knowing what I know, but my favorite thing to do when I was a little kid was puzzles. I love patterns and puzzles. Yeah, same. So now being aware of the cyclical nature of uh, patterns and pattern interruptions and being able to see the seasonal patterns and things, the universe becomes plastic according to the thoughts that you give the most power to and your beingness and essence that creates the fertile environment for whatever to grow. And in my case, birth was from the fertile environment of the womb of prison. It had to give birth to somebody that was living his fullest expression, overflowing into the other inmates, overflowing into the womb of, of the prison. Well, like a baby, what once grew on the inside is now produced on the outside called birth, but now mine was freedom. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What was the, what was the reaction when you had heard that? It was very surface level because I, I hadn't yet done all the practices and the methodologies and you know all, learn all these tools. I was like, I'm so lucky. Yeah, it was just so sweet, and I was like, Wow, God is good. I'm so lucky, but I didn't know the science of it. Sure, it's like the spiritual science and the the there's a texture and a flavor to it but this is what i put to serving healing other you know serving the healing of other humans and in my retreats and leadership and masterminds and things i do all over the world now that it's got there's texture to it now a lot of that texture and ingredients inside of it what happens if you didn't go to jail i probably would be dead and have several Random kids, random baby mamas, and I would have effed my life up. It wasn't meant for me to, to have the caliber of life back then as I have now mm -hmm. because I wasn't ready. I could not hold for it. I, I would, my, my, my ego was threatened a lot. I couldn't be in the space of another man or... Or, or, or even another person that's even in the same realm as me as far as how I operate energetically and not feel threatened. Mm. I would, I'd be threatened and, and everything would pull me out of the real me. Mm. Now, me being who I really am, there's nothing I need to do because all, all the doing is inside of my being right. and I can be with all people regardless of your opinions or anything, it's like I truly can be billionaires, millionaires, broken heirs, like people that deep healing, trauma people, um, artists, whatever. It, it's, the, it's the flavor of life. Yeah. You know, the, all the music, all, all the notes that's inside a symphony, those notes are inside of people. That's right. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, I feel into the divine masculine and the sacred masculinity and what's missing. And it's a lot of breaded competition. Mm -hmm. you know, we were bred to have to be better than the next person. Yeah. I mean, our, our families did it. The state sponsored schools did it. And then they brought in all the fear tactics and drama and all that stuff. And you see it across the board right now. You see it with children. I win, you lose. I win, you lose. Uh, or not only should I succeed, you should fail in the process. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the divide and conquer, ultimately. And to have that you know, reconciliation in life and for you to feel into the, the magic alchemy of being able to honor yourself so much that you can be in presence with other men and be in presence with other people that are doing amazing things is, is really the direction we need to be heading fully as a collective, not just one pocket of society that lives yeah. in Austin or lives in Topanga or lives in Laguna. We need the whole world to, 
to, to jump on this wave and to really stand with each other. That's how we don't get persuaded down these dark roads, and these dark <laughs> politics, yeah, and these dark medical systems, mm-hmm. and everything that's falling apart in front of us right now. And so you've taken this incredible story, and thank you for being candid about that and sharing that. That was that was incredible. I'm, so uh, welcome. That's, that's down. That's going to be dripping into my bone marrow <laughs> over the next 12, 14, 16 hours. Um, and I and I, I feel it right now. I feel what you you've experienced, and I can see how that can make someone um, really choose their destiny at that point, and not be a victim to circumstance. Remember the word you just used: is choose your destiny. It's going to come back later in our conversation. But sure. just remember what you just said. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, what from that point on was it trial and error, and kind of because it, it takes time. It's not a flip the switch script. You know, life is dynamic. That's why we do the practice. Yeah. That's why we have the discipline. That's why we have the rituals. You know, chop wood, carry water, yeah. come in light, and you do the same thing over and over. What happens subsequently after that experience? You come back to the States, and there's revelations, but I'm sure there's old tendencies that are still there, right, that have to be checked. Yes, because I didn't yet have a... You didn't have context, Context, a continuous practice. You can't change what you're not aware of. So there was, there was a lot that I wasn't aware of. So I didn't even realize that all of the stillness, see, in prison, all you have is your like mind and your heart. So it's like you can do way more things inside of the stillness than the busy monotonous of life. Yeah. So once I left prison, well, one, there were, I, I wrote like 20 songs in prison from birds that I heard outside uh, my, my, my jail cell because there was like a pitch, uh, a soccer pitch like right on the outside and I can hear these birds and I'm like, oh, that's a do 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 And I'd hear these melodies and I'd hear like these little knocks and I would turn them into music in my head and I would write songs into music from my head. So I said, you know, my goal is to get a record deal when I get out. I don't know how. I don't know who. I just, I've got these songs, and this is what I'm going to do. So I get out, and I have a... Um, You're you back know, in L.A.? I'm back in L.A. Yep. Uh, 2005? 2005. Yep. And I have a, you know, he's like... Brother, cousin, you know, somebody who's so close that you're just like the endearment that you call them a brother. They become family. Yeah. So D. Ray Davis is a comedian and uh, he allowed me to stay at his house. And he was like, man, I'll give you money, food, I'll give you a car, buy you clothes, everything. He's like, you want to be a singer, right? And I was like, yeah. He said, don't come home unless you have a song. Mm. <laughs> I knew nobody, had no money, no, no producer, no nothing. I love that. I was like, but I don't know. He's like, but you want to be a singer, right? He's like, yeah. Don't come home unless you have a song. Yeah. So that was the introduction of uh, MySpace. And so I got on and I didn't have any music. I didn't, all I had was like shirtless pictures, saying that I was a singer. And this was before spam, spam was around. So I messaged all these people. I mean, maybe it'd been like eight, 900 people. It was just like, hey, I'm a singer. Hey, I want to get in the studio. Hey, I want to get in the studio. Finally, this, this guy named John Henry, um, he was like, man, I'd like to invite you in the studio. I was like, what the fuck? So I record a song. When I recorded that song, which is my very first song, I put that on my MySpace, and then when I was on that MySpace, all of a sudden, all these producers that I hit up in the past start hitting me back. Bro, 30 days, I had 28 songs. And then after that, my brother is the host of the uh, improv on Monday nights in Los Angeles. And instead of him putting up a comedian, he said, my little brother just got out of prison and everything, and he's got this music. I didn't know who was in the audience. It's got this music, whatever, and I sang this song called Mr. Ordinary. And all of a sudden, uh, Jermaine Dupree was there and Ludacris was there. And so I met them both. It's like in their heyday. Yeah. Right? I mean, in the the hot. Yeah, yeah. So I met Luda. He was like, you got any music? I was like, yeah, I've gotten uh, 28 songs I recorded in the last 30 days. So I gave him my demo. Yeah. 
Two months later, I had a $500,000 record deal with DTP Def Jam. That's incredible. So I'm in the studio with two chains. I'm working with two chains. I'm writing songs with and for Chingy. I'm doing my own songs on MTV, in the magazines, with all this other stuff. And then all of a sudden, what they, who they signed me as was like a, it was Bruno Mars before Bruno Mars existed. Mm. It was the same melody, same flavor, same dressing, same style. So they were putting you into a box? No, no, no. When they signed me, there was no box. They were like, we're not going to change anything. Okay. Now, once I got signed, I started noticing my sound change and all these different... It was a so they subtle were, they way... They were morphing your, what you were producing and to, creating? Uh, in, in, in the innocence, they weren't like, you can't be yourself. They're trying to get me on radio. I got you. And at the time, they're not, nobody's making music like this. This is Bruno before Bruno. I got you. And High uh, pitch... High pitched tones, harmonies, colorful. Da 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 da. I had beautiful girl. I had fifty songs like that before beautiful girls ever came out. When that came out, everybody thought it was me. Oh wow! And so, so when that happened, and then I started shifting. I allowed it. I didn't stand for the real me and my natural expression that got me signed in the first place. Mm. All of a sudden, I'm on stage with gangster rappers, and all of a sudden, I'm doing this, and I'm making music that in my core, I know this is not me. This is not the resonance. This is not the sound, and I sold out so that I can get on radio, but I was so far removed from who I was. Now, I'm writing songs for people, trying to be them and sound like them. And the more and more I was trying to be like everyone else to write <clears throat> for everyone else, I wasn't being who Garen really was and my true expression and my true magic and my true bigness. And when I gave that away, I didn't know how to come back. Mm. And then all of a sudden... Were you like, well, I'm sorry, but were you like, wait, I've been here before. No, I wasn't aware. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like what, what you just experienced... I wasn't aware. Okay. That was, it was okay. like, you. That was you a whole nother reality. Literally can't see the picture while you're in the frame. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All this, it's all things happening. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm lucky. Yeah, wow, yeah. look at this happening, whatever. Got it. I'm not even realizing everything that's happening was the overload of how much I beat on my craft while I was in prison. Yeah. In the incubation, in the womb of healing. Yeah. So I wasn't aware that what was happening was the overflow. So when the overflow ran out, ego crept back in. Girls were, t I started making music so I can get into girls' pants and the hotel rooms. And this is, I'm so unaware of what's happening. And I didn't realize just how powerful the ego was. So once I was in the frequency of humility, the whole world became this rich texture of favor on my life. And when I was in my ego, just as fast as it rose was just as fast as it dropped. I got dropped from Def Jam, but I was still on DTP. And, I knew, and DTP wasn't the right like flavor for me. So I ended up leaving DTP and I was just like, I'll do this myself. Final straw in music. I'm in the studio and I won't say his name, but with a platinum selling uh, R&B artist writing a song. And at this time, there was no money coming in. This was like later on, and I, I was living, literally living in my car, like trying to go in and sleep in different girls' houses, couch to couch, and like oscillating back and forth between my car and girls' houses and couches, because still no money coming in, because yeah. I wouldn't get the $500,000 uh, from the record deal unless the album released. It never came out. Yeah. So no money coming in. I'm in the studio, big break, big artist, big artist. I'm writing a song, co-writing it with him and other people in the room, come up with certain melodies, come up with certain lyrics. I'm like, yo, this is the big break. I'm in the lowest point of my life, but this is it. He asked me to be in the studio and I'm doing all this stuff. Next thing you know, I emailed the manager. They said, oh, no, they completely changed the whole song. So you, there won't be any credit because they, they just like rearranged the whole song. 
the song comes out, exact same song, same lyrics, people that weren't even in the studio that night got credit, I got left off. It goes number one, it wins a Grammy, sells two, two, two million records, so I'm watching while I'm in debt, struggling. A record I co-wrote, win a Grammy, sell two million records, go number one. Wow. And that's when I said, fuck music, fuck these people. They were like, oh no, you, you gotta pay your dues. No, fuck these dues. Yeah. I'm not this, whatever this weird shit is, y'all yeah. can keep all of that. I'm going to figure out a way to build myself up. I don't know how, I don't know how long it's gonna take, and that's when I just went in. But that's when I went dark. That's when I went cold. That's when I just went, put on 25, 30 pounds. And, it was a tipping point. Oh, and, super uh, tipping point. I left yeah. music. That parasitic. Yeah. Mode, yeah. Yeah. It was like, fuck the world. That's I, Tupac style. Yeah. yeah like, fuck just, the world. Fuck me. Everybody. Yeah. I didn't realize how many friends I left in the entertainment industry. I completely, because I, like, poof, yeah. out. Yeah. The only thing I had available to me was my car. Mm. So I say, you know what? I can't take away my car. Take away the deal. Take away this. Take away my, you know, at that time, like, you know, I was trying to repair a relationship with my, with my first daughter. If you don't love yourself, how are you going to give yeah. what you, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't even, I wasn't even know that. So I was shame, guilt. My mom's dying in the hospital. I'm an ex-convict, black man in America, deadbeat. Dead. You know what I'm saying? I'm literally all of the statistics where people, it's the 1% of the 1% of the 1% who don't make it out. And if they do, they can't articulate it. Yeah. They're, they're like in the brain. There's no toolbox and it's just desperation mode at that point. And that's why people are driven to do the craziest shit at that point. And it's not, it's not rocket science why that happens. Yeah. So you're right there. So you have every, you have every box right back. there. Yeah. Yeah. Three forty three in the morning, August two thousand and eleven. This is when I had already tried to kill myself twice. Girlfriend had just broken up with me because I couldn't get my life together. Mom dying in the hospital, colostomy bag, like all my family's overweight and everything. And I was just like, man, this fucking life. And I just cried out, okay, I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be surrounded by nothing but positive people. I just want to inspire people. And I want to make a bunch of money. But I want the money to represent something that I passionately believe in, that I would do for free. Just show me a sign. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. And then there was silence. A week goes by and a homeless guy comes up to me while I'm at the gas station with my last $2. And in LA, you can't even get a gallon of gas with $2. Ask me for money. And I say, you have more money than me. And the homeless guy, which I feel was my angel, said, change your mindset, change your life. And walks away. And it was right there that the seed of transformation was planted. And I wasn't even aware, but it was right there. I've heard people say motivational words, but not words that harness the energy to stop me in my tracks and all, every thought I've ever had in my life and cause a conscious interrupt. Change your mind. So if, is my life a lie because of how I've been thinking? Change your life. Change your mindset. Change your life. So if I do the opposite of everything I would normally do in areas of my life where I, I'm not happy, my life will change. Well, I was unhappy. I was a womanizer. I was uh, full of pride and ego. I, I was a, a lone wolf. I talked about people behind their back. I didn't have any relationship with my family, didn't have a relationship with my daughter. And so then this little magical seed of change your mindset, change your life 
I couldn't get it out of my head. It became my favorite song. Change your mindset, change your life, change your mind. Okay, there's some, there's some escalators. Change your mindset, change your life. So I'm gonna take the stairs. And so I start practicing. And I didn't know I was practicing, but I just kept doing the opposite of everything that I, I could easily do. Well, an object in motion stays in motion. So when bigger things came about, oh, Gary, you wanna go, you wanna go to the club and get these hoes? Change your mindset, change your love. No, I'm good. Then I started practicing eating healthy. I started looking for a healthy, active lifestyle community. I started practicing reading books instead of scrolling or watching TV or whatever it was and doing the opposite in all of those areas that was going to hell in a handbasket with an elephant and two tons taped to it. And those became little gateways to heaven on earth. <laughs> the Alice in Wonderland door where it stretched to fit her size and all she had to do was walk through it. I walked through change and I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, which was my past and literally rewrote it by flipping what I was domesticated in. And that one seed of transformation then has my life as a direct flip. So if you can imagine the prison, imagine the diss, now imagine the opposite. Hallelujah. Momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. What year is that? 2000. And so I get out in 2005, but I was just numb with emotions all the way till 2011. Okay, so 2012, 2013. Um, Garen starts to remember who he is. Yeah, 2011, I was introduced to a healthy, active lifestyle community and yeah. people working yeah. out yeah. and, yeah, yeah, and working out on the beach and drinking healthy smoothies. And it's a world I, ne I knew nothing about. Yeah. Nothing about. Yeah, you're from a whole nother level of materialism. Yeah. And that whole track. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're like talking about taking over the world and making, you know, as Eric Thomas was the first piece of personal development, success is bad as you want to breathe. And I was like, I ain't never, I was like, what's happening to me? I ain't never wanted something that bad. <laughs> so then I started listening to like John C. Maxwell and Jim Rohn and Napoleon Hill. And I mean, I, I mean, the same way I would chase women. I started chasing books yeah. with the same energy. Before I knew what energy transmutation was, that energy literally transferred into, oh my God, book and lesson and book. And, and I wouldn't just do it once. I would read a book 10 times in a row and like not read it for memory. I would read it for mastery. Right. I read the book until it started reading me. Yeah, that's love. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, lust for knowledge. Over and over. And I was like, man, more and more I do this. And Thoughts are different. My dreams are different. The way I'm speaking is different. People are like, hey, you're, you're probably you're like, you're probably looking different. Way the different shifts were happening from the inner people scene. thought. People thought I got plastic surgery. Yeah, I believe it. I totally believe it. And I've seen like, people morph once they start realizing. The, yeah, the hot air, hot air balloon can't leave the ground unless you release the weight. Right. So through all of this healing and transformation, I even forgave the two men who murdered my father. Mm. I mean, wholeheartedly, but I, needed to, I, I had to do it every day a thousand, like literally a thousand times. It's not forgive. You forgive once and it's over. No, it's like the weeds don't need anything to grow but time. Yeah. So you must always nurture the garden if you want a fruitful garden. That's right. So you must always nur nourish your... Uh, nourish your forgiving, forgiving heart yeah. uh, if, if you want a fruitful life. Yeah. So forgiving and letting go of resentment of you know, a family member who touched me as a little boy and, and like really, mm. man, when I tell you the depths and the deep, I was like, show me any door. Show me it. whatever it is I'm meant to see. Show it. What's the impact? Who caused it? What created it? What story did I create? I became the same hunger that I had for women. 
And there's nothing wrong with loving the 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 fruits of life and and just literally. The th- but when I gave it power, and I didn't have myself, that's what was wrong. Right. So my lust and losing myself in food and women, I then turned it towards knowledge, yeah. reading. No music, no TV. It's literally that level of knowledge and most people don't do as much. I read The Power of Positive Thinking over 350 times between the paperback and audio book. So I just kept going and kept going, doing 10-day silent retreats, five days in complete dark and, and, and doing mastery and transformation training, all of this healing. I mean, it was the level of which I beat on my craft, wanting to get to know who I really am deep down on the inside, developing the great depths of trust. I didn't realize great depths of trust leads to great depths of intuition. You do not get access to true intuition. You get like little spigots of it, but true intuition is birthed from deep trust, not of other people, of yourself. So that became the 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 fruits of the tree of the evolution of Garen while being the world's greatest student and a leader simultaneously. <laughs> this is unbelievable, the story that is unfolding right now for people to be listening to because there's a lot of parallels between the two of us in many ways. You know, I, I once too had a lot of the... I would say the the lusts and the frequency of domination and the frequency of wanting to take over the world and all of those things that was uh, surmised into my my I would say into my brain into my heart into my system that I had to uh, you know push forward with such alpha energy and such testosterone throughout my mid twenties and then this finally snap out of it through a you know a near death experience. Mm. So, melt away I, I felt something you didn't have, you didn't have to tell me but I, f- I felt whatever you're about to share I could feel it in my soul yeah hearing you and and being witness to this this story is is just churning every cell in my body mm. and, you know creating desire for me to want to keep going further and further and further and I, I know there was moments there was years from 2016 to 2018 before my father got sick that I all I was doing was investigating myself mm. you know everything shut off all the sound all the music all the women all the noise all the tv all that stuff and it was just paralyzing myself in the darkness nine point death meditation in the jungles shaman training near death experiences every weekend with entheogens con- continuing to explore and explore never-ending quest of finding myself and finding my true identity and um it was there was moments there where i didn't think i was going to make it out you know Mm. and i was i was trusting the process and i was okay with it Mm. you know the act of dying before dying the samadhi and the release of all that and as cathartic as it was it was the it was the ground floor of becoming the new flower and the blossom and to really hold reverence for people and showing up for humanity, not by telling people what they're doing wrong, but just being the embodiment. Mm-hmm. And um, right now in your life, this is the this is your this is your the pillars that you hold. This is the pillars you hold for your partner, for your your children, for your entire community. I feel like you've taken centuries, if not millenniums, of karma mm-hmm. that has ended up into your life and have been able to stop it right there and metamorphic and morphogenically field evolve it into the most beautiful story of all time. And I'm just telling you as a brother to witness Mm. because I didn't know much of this. And so I'm in a ceremony right now with you. Mm. And today's been a very, very powerful day. I've had some midwives on here and some really powerful, uh, 
women and, and feminine energy. And what I'm get, getting from you also is a really beautiful feminine energy, meaning um, the, the, the witness of self and mm-hmm. to be able to sit in the pain and accept and move on and, and realize that's not your story. That's not who you are. And you're continuing to share this through your men's work. Is that the is that where you're at right now? No, it's you know I I have different projects. I know that because ninety five percent of my audience is powerful driven women. However, I know I think same with mine. <laughs> <laughs> I know that the uh, the the part of me that women are attracted to is the the holistic man that they feel safe around with no agenda. Yeah. And ultimately they heal the masculine inside of them because women had to come up in a man's world by default. Totally. You know what I'm saying? So being in a different aspect of a man is just healing in its own embodiment and witness. So there's one. Is that and, letting their guard down and letting know that oh, they, they just trust? App, this guy is... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's when the real magic comes out because sure. there's no hidden agenda for me other than restoring nature as it was designed. Nature inside of humans, nature inside of men, nature inside of women, not man's world, but nature's world. Right. Not man's... Uh, uh, um, uh, what is it called? Not us trying to rewrite it and... and yeah. Put our, Material imprint on what it's supposed to be. Yes. Just the divine nature of how this whole world works. How right. how the world works. And like I was saying, there was like there's two systems literally going on right now. There's nature system and there's man system because and this is I'm not down downing men. However, there were unhealthy men that created a position of power once they realized that how much power women had just because they could give birth, that level of power, just me witnessing my wife do that, I'm like, oh, I ain't never in my life seen anything like that. You were there for a oh, 100% the, in, in, in his true chief essence and stoicism, mm. holding space for that level of birth in our home. I can see how a man who doesn't truly has have his full self and his true embodiment can be threatened by that level of power. So what would he do? Push the woman down, push the woman down, create man's world, and then take us away from nature's system. Yeah. Now, if you look at the construct of life, you got all these different... This person wanting to be this person, this person wanting to be this person, this energy wanting to be in this energy and this. And it's it's almost like as this nature is out of balance. Mm-hmm. My role is I sit right in the middle. So grateful that I was raised by all women and the streets and prison and and it groomed, it raised the masculine out of me, but then being in Austin developed my healthy masculine so that I could be in harmony inside of that energy, which created chief energy. There's like, there's like, there's king, and I think there's another level that is the harmonious of the both energies, and that's a chief. And I sit up right there at the top to come in peace and restore nature as it was designed. Mm. So inside of my work, that's the underlying of everything. If I'm working with men, my goal is to restore nature as it was designed. So if they have issues with accepting accepting the feminine energy inside of them and don't even realize that the part of the part of me that they fully let in is the part they even let their own mom in, mm-hmm. which is the feminine that I've accepted in myself. Mm-hmm. And with the women, part of me that they let in is the masculine that they long for and they don't even realize that they haven't yet been exposed to. Mm. And all I want to do is create harmony inside of nature. So there's the men's work. There's my own retreats, but my retreats are 90% women. 
My, my, it's called Awaken the Artist Within. The artist is the little kid inside before life stripped away all your powers. I teach people how to safely tap back into that energy. It unlocks a power. The name of my company is called Artist Power. And so it's a great place for healing, uh, free, freedom to express who you really are, that deep level of safety and all walks of life and all different genres of who, how much money, you, they all come because what they want is full expression, full embodiment. They don't want to overcompensate. And they're just like, man, what's my true sacred note in life? Mm. I support people in finding that so they can use their true expression, their true voice. Book, leadership, courses, masterminds, retreats, all of that comes from the deep well of that. That's beautiful. It's a living, breathing embodiment that's consistently evolving as you evolve, right? Yeah. As you raise your child, as you have more experiences. And that is... Um, you know, for me, you know, sitting here with Garen and, and receiving this, I immediately feel into how many people could experience this type of opportunity mm. and literally drastically change their entire life and their entire perspective of life and the trajectory of where they're going. Um, it's never too late. Mm -mm. You know, it's never too late to get out of your own way. And a lot of this is just coming down to unlearning, you know, a lot of the systems that have been embedded into us, a lot yeah. of the fear program, programming and a lot of the sick escapism habits. You know, there's just most people are just not in a, in a place to practice self-love. They might not feel that they're worthy of it for whatever reason. It could be one traumatic experience at age three. It could be what happened yeah. when they were in the womb. It could be anything. And um, it's never too late. And you're a perfect example, yeah. a shiny example of that and illuminating pure love. And um, I'm, I'm just thinking about my father and I'm thinking about so many um, people that just have been trapped in their circumstances and said, you know, this is just the facts of life. You know, this is the facts of life. Fuck that. Mm. That's not the case, um, especially if you're hearing this. Yeah, um, because some kind of karma brought you into this audio file with this frequency coming through. I'm I'm blown away at, at who you are. I'm not mm. blown away at your story. I'm blown away at who you are and your embodiment and the the level of love and honor that you hold and just being so um, expansive and open with it. Mm -hmm. That's a, a real missing nuance. Uh, in this world right now and the open vulnerability yeah that's that's your mastery is in the vulnerability right and quickly know. i want to speak into that yeah i never would have been open and vulnerable because it you know everybody's got things that they're probably afraid to share what's mom gonna think then one day i wrote a letter from my big self to my little self apologizing to little Garen for leaving him, for abandoning him. Like I thought, I, like my dad abandoned me. It's like, no, like the original abandonment is when you abandon what you loved as a child. Mm. Um, probably for sake of approval or anything like, else like that. But I apologize to little Garen uh, for leaving him. And then I switched to my non-dominant hand and I wrote a letter from little Garen to big Garen. I was not prepared for the emotions that came up. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff that I stuffed down just came up. And I was like, you fucking left me. You left me and I'm crying, I'm crying. And I was like, oh my God, no. We get to bring them two back together. Mm -hmm. And I went on Facebook and I said, you, uh, this, it's on the post right now. At this time, I wasn't getting any likes. I didn't really have an Instagram. I didn't have a lot of comments, anything like that. And I wrote a post and I said, you think you know me? You have no idea. Here's what you know because this is what I told you. But what you don't know is right now I'm living in my car, sleeping back and forth between an abandoned building 
um, and, and my storage unit, sleeping on bubble wrap, $200,000 in debt, mom dying in the hospital. Like literally that was all of that. And I shared it in its rawest mm. without, without fear, caring what anybody thought. Yeah. First message I got from somebody, thank you for your strength. I put the gun down mm -hmm. when I read your testimony. And that moment right there, um, I said, I know why I'm here. I'm here to be the voice of the voiceless or the parts of you that you haven't yet given a voice. So when I express in the frequency of vulnerability and put it out there, inside of that Inside of that container, people feel like they can stand up in the kiddie pool and be like, me too. Mm -hmm. Me too. Oh, my God. S -s -s Someone. I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. No. You're not alone. You're not the only one. Yeah. And just like, you know, I, it came to me in my in a, in a, in a, I was in a medicine journey. I was in a psilocybin journey. And I called upon my ancestors. And I was like, I want to know every ill will thing that anyone in my family lineage has ever done. And I want to face it. And you know, it came to me. They say, Garen, we can't show you because you already lived it. You were actually the one that was chosen and like Christ died for our sins. I mean, they say Christ died for our sins. It's like, Garen, you died for all of our sins. And when you resurrected is when I ascended. Now you have all of our powers. Garen, just allow yourself to be an open channel and you will be used and you'll be used at full capacity in ways that don't make sense to human understanding. Right. And all I want to do is teach people how to tune, tone, clear their channels, and allow themselves to be the vessel for the divine and allow all the ancient wisdom, all the ancestral wisdom to harmonize with the truest essence of yourself. You plug yourself into nature, you benefit from all of its resources. Oh, brother. Thank you for what you're doing. You're taking the load off my back mm. because that's essentially my my entire ethos is to wake people up into their own power, truly, not in some cliche way, but from their deep God-given ability. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the stories, it's the experiences, it's the guy that put the gun down it's those moments that, for me, fuel the motivation and the inspiration to keep going. Because there are moments where you want to step away from everything. You want to disappear in the jungles. You want to shut it down. But then you realize that there's somebody out there. There's somebody in the same shoes as you. There's somebody that has the same issues, same things. And they need that voice. Mm. They need that reflection. And they need to know that this is real. This isn't just a fragment of my imagination or some hallucination that can never happen. Yeah. And hope is real, you know, but foundational hope with truth and tools and all of these things, that's when it becomes reality. Yeah. So I, I honor you on your mm. entire craft, brother. And I'm here for your entire support. <laughs> And um, I'm sure we're going to unravel a lot of stuff together. There's so much that I want to get into. <laughs> <laughs> we have a 24-hour podcast because I want to dig into your story too yeah, and yeah. All, like, all the stuff. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. Yeah. And we'll do a lot of it offline and it can come back for sure. publicly for sure. But um, it's so refreshing, you know, so refreshing to be able to have a conversation with um, a brother on this level you know i i have these conversations with the feminine we get into these areas of vulnerability and 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 sadness and what is 
hurting the little child within. And that happens a lot and it's beautiful. It's a little bit different when you're doing it with your brother. Um, Mm. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. And I'm just speaking from my perspective. This is not segregating any race or any or any sex or anything like that women need to have sisters men need to have brothers absolutely yeah it's it's in the it's in the dna it's in the Mm -hmm. vibratory field it's in our pheromones it's it's everything to it and um we've been we've, we've really been led astray to not be able to have this level of openness with each other and that's a complete pervasion of our agglomation of being human beings and walking this life hand in hand and knowing that we got this. And that's what community is all about. At yeah. The end of the day, mm-hmm. Right. And so I'm here to support anything and everything that you're doing out there in Austin. We have, we're tribing up and I'm there for it. I'm there for the entire ride. Mm. This is uh hopefully you can make uh, it out. I have a, yeah. my, my, I have a, my awaken the artist within retreat, uh, May 18th through the 22nd. We got, 75 rooms and it's this is in austin yes oh man it's 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 a really powerful container cool yeah may 18th may 18th through the 22nd okay mm-hmm. maybe we'll we're not going to japan anymore so i think that might that might be a possibility this yeah is a I, I, I would uh, say it again. this is a co-ed or co-ed yeah okay yeah no is it'll it be it'll be percent women it'll be nine it'll be 90 percent women 90 yeah. percent women yeah okay mm-hmm all right, well, I'm definitely coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it would be a um, beautiful space. And the reason why it's so powerful and healing is because the level of deep safe. Yeah. The deep safety when that nervous system, especially in a woman, feels safe. Mm. She will show who she re- really is and all her messy and then turn that into a message. And it's it's beautiful. And then how... Uh, the type of men that I attract in that container has a very similar flavor and essence. Yeah. Other men are threatened because mm. they don't. You come into a container with me, you'll be confronted with yourself. Sure. Because it, there's no hidden agenda inside of that space, but that's why it's so powerful. Yeah. You can feel the texture of it. Yeah. Because. That's the level of safety I need to be the level of deep channel and access the beyond human that happens in there. I tell people all the time, if you can imagine um, uh, Rufio from Peter Pan, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, Tony Robbins, and Harry Potter and the Hogwarts, and then you blend it up, but way more Hogwarts... <laughs> You get Garen Jones. That's awesome. And this is what happens at my retreats. I, I, I know the Rufio. I don't know the I don't know the Harry Potter Hogwarts too much. But Wizards. You're talking about just wizardry. W- wizardry. Yeah. Like there's a <laughs> there's an aspect inside of that level of uh, safety and permission where I get used. Well, we'll just say the vessel called Garen gets used in a way that Wait, what, what? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then because of how I lead other leaders, then it becomes one body that orchestrates this entire symphony of healing and revealing and reviving and fun and adventure and magic. It's to truly be a kid again without trying to put on and trying to have fake fun Whatever's in the way of your real joy yeah. and your real fun and your real level of deep play and creativity, it often gets removed. And then what's always been there comes to the surface. I love it. Yep. Yeah, that's the, that's the art of healing, my friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's contagious. That spreads like wildfire. Yeah. You know, people want to be around that. They want to remember. They've forgotten what they've forgotten and all of a sudden. They get that that blooming energy, and um, my background. I'm an anthroposophist, and at the culmination of that entire philosophy is the moment you forget your inner child is the moment you become rigid, and rigidity becomes solidified, and solidification becomes calcification, and from there, disease starts to take effect, mm. and you leave the health span 
into the disease span. And so I've studied this and researched this and I've read countless, countless peer, peer reviewed published studies, psychosomatic studies on this very topic that you're actually injecting back into the lives of men and women. Mm. And it's, it's valid to the highest level and it's, it's real. And I, and I think that I'd like to come shake it off over there and get into the authentic child version of Shervian. That would be so fun. Yeah, and just go absolutely berserk. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I spend a lot of time with my, my cousin David Wolf, and he's the embodiment of a child. And in every state, everything is an adventure. Everything is an experience. He's completely disconnected from anything of the material world. And he was my mentor growing up. He tutored me in all things, science, life, everything. And every time I'm around him... I actually feel like I'm 12 years young again. And yeah. it's, a, it's an adventure. And it's and I almost now feel, you know, he's 11 years older than me. I feel like I'm older than him at times because of just the the, 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 the all the left brain stuff that I, I have in my field. And uh, ultimately, I see the path of childhood coming back. The Benjamin Button is coming yeah. back. And um, I'm ready for it. So, hey, man. Yo, I want to show you. This. Yeah, yeah. Let's check it out. I want to show you this in my phone. I'm going to show you a picture of when I was 30, literally 34. Okay. And then a picture of me uh, last year. So in this picture right here, in this picture right here, I'm 34. Wow. Now look at the side by side. Wow. <laughs> the biology of belief you're doing it brother thank you're you doing it man hallelujah thank you for sharing all this and um that's truly what wake the fake up mm. is all about it's resuscitating the senile cells within and this is what it's all about yeah Thank you for creating a, being brave enough to open up this space and creating a platform for stories like mine and yours to have wings. There's somebody, it may not be gazillions of people, it might be one person that says, me too, I can resonate with both of those guys, me too. And that one seed turns into the next Albert Einstein, you never know. Yeah, that seed becomes a... The redwood forest. Mm. Uh, we just keep planting them. We keep planting them. Yeah, bro. What a life. What a ride. What a yeah. Day. Let's keep it going. For sure. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Hey, uh, that's the stretch beyond the mics. <laughs> <laughs>